Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the January 22nd, 2024 Tualatin City Council meeting. I'm going to go ahead and call this meeting to order. Uh, tonight will be led uh, in the Pledge of Allegiance by Councillor Sacco. brings us to public comment. Uh, public comment is an opportunity for anyone to address the City Council regarding an item that is not on tonight's agenda. Please keep your comments to about three minutes. If there's anyone in the room that would like to address the Council, this would be the appropriate time. Then after that, I'll take folks on Zoom. Everybody who'd like to have public comment in the room. No, there's no one on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No, we got no AI to the end. Great. All right. That brings us to the consent agenda then. The consent agenda are items that are considered routine. Mayor. They'll be adopted by one motion unless someone in the council would like an item removed and heard separately later tonight. Tonight, the consent agenda consists of item number one, consideration of approval of the work session and regular meeting minutes of January 8th, 2024. Item number two, consideration of resolution number 5751 dash 24, awarding the contract for con construction of Veterans Plaza at the Tualatin Commons. And item number three, consideration of the system development charge annual reports for fiscal year 2022-2023. Uh, would a counselor like any item removed from consent tonight? Mayor, I, I have a, um, that that is not the most updated agenda. Oh. We pulled the minutes. Um, Yours old. <laughs> uh, yes, but, from the second. <clears throat> Sorry, because we pulled the minutes because of last week's kerfuffle, and then we have an employee introduction. So. Okay. So, uh, let's deal with the consent. So yeah. there's only two items. There's only two items. So yes. Items number two and three. Yes. All right. Okay. So uh, we have two items on the agenda. We'll strike number one. Uh, any discussion or motions? I motion that we move, um, approve the consent agenda as read. Second. I have a motion and a second to adopt the two consent agendas as read. Any discussion on those motions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, new employee introduction. All right, Mayor, Mayor Buminick, uh, members of council, Kevin McConnell, city attorney. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to our uh, new legal assistant uh, for the legal department. This is Heather Heidel. She most recently came to us from Chicago Title of Oregon, where she served uh, four years in that capacity and gained some great experience uh, in real property transactions and the like, which is very beneficial uh, to what the city does here. Uh, prior to that, she worked as a legal assistant in, in that capacity for several law firms in the Portland metro area and gained general experience drafting legal documents and pleadings and doing legal research. Uh, I'd like you to uh, just join me in welcoming Heather uh, to the city of uh, Tualatin, and she started uh, the day after the Thanksgiving holiday, so that, that, that uh, Monday. So she's been here just a little bit. I've been here bit. for a little bit. Yeah, thank you. Welcome, Heather. Thank you. Anything you'd like to say? Um, I'm just really happy to have the opportunity to be here. Um, like I said, I've been here for almost two months now, and I really love it, so I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Yeah. So can you tell us more about what a legal assistant does? Because we don't have a lot of exposure. We usually see you, but not your staff. Well, <laughs> sure, Mayor. And, and what the legal assistant does uh, essentially is set meetings uh, as necessary for uh, the, the city attorney and uh, city staff and outside individuals that the city attorney uh, deals with. Uh, assisting in drafting legal pleadings, looking over, we, we do a, a few things with the municipal court as far as uh, municipal court trials. I know we have one scheduled uh, coming up. And then we, uh, the legal assistant, essentially assist me in drafting all the legal documents 
that's demand letters, uh, legal pleadings, and the like, and uh, finalizing contracts, IGAs, and things like that. So that's essentially what the legal assistant does. It's uh, really keeping the office, uh, everybody on their toes in the office, uh, myself and Richard Contreras, the contract management specialist, and there is a, a ton of work that it, it to do and phone calls to take, and so she is uh, staying busy and she's learning and doing a very good job. Uh, she has been given kudos by multiple members of city staff uh, for her expertise. She has assisted the city attorney's office and city staff on some uh, recent property transactions as well, right. which is very beneficial. All right. Well, Bert, welcome. Thank I'm you. glad to have you on board. Thank you. Um, you know, Kevin's relatively new, so it's kind of a good start. You know, you both. You know, working together as a dynamic duo and looking forward to working with you both on hopefully will be, his be nice and quiet here, <laughs> no big challenges, but, um, but I very much appreciate you coming to Twalton yeah. and uh, sharing your talents with us. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. All right. All right. Thank you for coming Thank you. tonight. Thank you very much. All right. So now we're rejiggered here. <laughs> we'll, move, we'll move on to special reports. Our first special report is from the Juanita Poll Center Advisory mm -hmm. Committee. Uh, that would be Sarah Shepard, I believe. Are you coming up? I know. Because everyone just was sitting there. No one's coming. <laughs> so Sarah and yes, Susan's shy. <laughs> That's what everyone says about you. Yeah. Okay, good evening, Mayor Bubenick and members of council. My name is Sarah Shepard. I am the center supervisor at the Juanita Poll Center, and we are here tonight to present the annual report, and Sus Susan Nowak will uh, present the report. She's the chair of the advisory committee at the Poll Center. Here we go. That's our committee. We're small but mighty. Uh -huh. um, and, um, uh, Amanda and Bob and Thea have been on the committee for several years. And Peggy's new this year, or in 2023, and now, and we're really happy to have her. So. Let's switch on. Oh, okay. Sorry. Ooh. You're temperamental tonight. Go back. Yeah. I need to go back one. <laughs> there we go. Well, as you can see from the, the uh, script on the slide, um, what does our committee do? And um, we work with um, Sarah and Marilyn um, all year long. And we get, when we meet, we're given all the, uh, the data for the uh, month prior to our meeting. And uh, we know the numbers. We know what if there are any issues, and there really aren't because it's run so well. But if there are issues, we discuss them. Uh, we talk about how to market and how to um, expand and um, what kind of programs that are needed. Um, some examples of our uh, programming, and there are many. I'm only going to give you a few. Um, there, uh, we have art classes. We have lunch and learns. We have social activities like the book club and bingo and pool. There are walking and hiking groups. Uh, there's an Earthwise crew, which pr uh, promoting environmental wellness for older adults, and a variety of fitness classes that are just packed between silver sneakers and tai chi and yoga and the veterans program on Saturday mornings. Um, and we have evidence-based classes supported by data. Uh, Marilyn and Sarah do a tremendous job of finding the right programs that will educate our seniors and keep us healthy. One thing that supports nonprofits and, and uh, centers like our senior center our, our partnerships and our community relationships, and uh, they're vital to the success of this program, any program, especially if you're familiar with nonprofits. You don't exist without the support of volunteers in the community. And um, as you can see from the slide, um, Meals on uh, the Senior Center does it really well. That's a huge list of uh, partners and sponsors uh, for anyone, and especially for, for a senior center. Um, the um, Meals on Wheels has been a partner with the city for over 40 years, um, probably 45 years now. Uh, and then um, uh, the Lunch and Learns are, is it, is it uh, 
Medicare Mike just does the lunch and learns. Med Medicare, Medicare Mark does the lunch and learns, and uh, he's just a wealth of knowledge and really helps our seniors. And um, Oasis Senior, uh, Senior Advisors is our book club sponsor. Uh, Tualatin Sustainability Network is our Earthwise crew partner. And um, back now for the, the second year is Washington County Aging and Disability as they support a lot of our programs and also our veterans yoga um, on Saturday mornings. And I have a quote from them because this is a big partnership. If you, um, I'm sure you know because you deal, deal a lot with Washington County. This is a very important partnership for our senior center. And the quote is, the Juanita Pole Center has demonstrated strategic leadership and passionate support for the older adults they serve. We are grateful for our unique partnership with JPC as it would be a challenge to provide support to local seniors without this trusted connection to the community. That says a lot for what we do in Tualatin and, and, and what Sarah and Marilyn do at the center. Um, Sarah has also, um, over the years that she's been with us, seven now? Is it seven yeah. years? Yeah, seven years. Um, has a really strong partnership with the National Recreation and Parks Association. And we've received na nationwide press and videos and grants. They've been in our building uh, to watch what we do and to report on it to the nation. So that's pretty special too. As the benefits that are outlined on this slide are keys to combat the um, high risk that seniors uh, can experience, which is so social isolation and poor health, both major conditions um, that sometimes are life-threatening to older adults. And we don't really think about that, that um, you're alone and don't have anywhere to be. And the Senior Center um, does a tremendous job of reaching out to the seniors in our community and uh, and they do wellness checks, they check on them, and they work really hard to find the right programs uh, to enhance our lives rather and save our lives. So um, it's important. These are uh, just some uh, very lively photos of the kinds of programs that um, are represented at the at JPC. Um, the mental, mental wellness and stress management fair uh, was extremely successful. Lots of vendors and booths and information handed out. Um, we have some Spanish speaking classes that uh, come to the center, uh, guitar lessons. Uh, the seniors I got together and did the letters for wintertime characters and um, wrote over 200 letters uh, for the young participants in this program over the holidays. And, mm -hmm. 400 this year? Oh. 400. <laughs> it, it was 200 a year ago. <laughs> it grew. No. Um, uh, the numbers that you see on the slides, um, that is um, how many people come in our building. And uh, it's impressive. And here are adults and senior adults in action. They're busy with our billiard tournament that's extremely successful. And it's a big tournament, and they have prizes and, and uh, treats, and they take it very seriously, but they have a lot of fun. And they're consistent. They're in the building every day, almost every week. And um, the highlight, I think, of the year at JPC is the Veterans Breakfast. Um, Sarah and Marilyn and her, their volunteers do a fabulous job. You all know that. You're all there. The community comes, and the veterans come. And it really is a high point in, uh, in a year in the life of JPC to, to honor our veterans. And um, they do day trips, and, they, and they've done some night trips, overnight trips, and they were very successful and a lot of fun. Um, the Lighthouse Tour was, was fun. They've gone down to uh, Silverton for the um, Oregon Gardens. Is it Oregon Gardens? Mm -hmm. That one. Um, and uh, they've gone to see the, the Christmas ships this winter. Uh, so they, they get us out. And here they are um, at a hike at Silverton Falls and the Earthwise crew and um, our day trekkers. Um, uh, we have some very active seniors in the group. Now this one is exciting. As you know, we were closed for two years. We opened in January 2022. Took till about March to get people to know we were open again and probably a little longer. Um, but um, 
In 2022, there were 45 rentals of the building, which means either night or weekends, with 5,000 guests coming through the building in a year. In 2023, there were 204 rentals and over 21,000 guests coming through the building just for rentals. And the exposure in that is just pretty, it's, impre it's impressive. You know, it's a lot of people. It's almost our whole population. Um, Okay, I remember back when we bought these chairs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was a good 10 years ago. That was back um, when it was still Meals on Wheels running the building, and we had a gift shop. And uh, the money raised from the gift shop bought the tables and chairs in the dining room. So they've gone through a lot of wear and tear. The, t the, t the tables are still working pretty well, but the, uh, the chairs not. And because uh, they're used not only in the dining room, but in the exercise classes. And they... Um, all the seats have been recovered, 160 chairs, mm -hmm. and now they're working on the backs. So uh, probably in another six months or a year, we'll, we'll uh, look new again. And the before and in the in between buying those and uh, today, the uh, interior was redesigned and we've got new furniture and uh, in the in the back sitting area and in the front and um, spruce building up. We don't look old anymore because we're all young in there. Our action plan is, um, it's not changing much. With, um, um, I say this every year when I come, but I mean it so sincerely. Marilyn and Sarah do the most fantastic job. I visit other centers, and I, and I go on websites, and I look at other centers, and I have friends in other communities all the way down to Klamath Falls, and they don't do it, it as well as we do it here. And uh, it's the truth. Um, I'm, I'm not blowing smoke on this one. We are. Uh, we really stand above, and it's recognized around the communities. So uh, we just keep doing what we're doing. Uh, what we're doing, and the biggest, um, the hardest thing we have is uh, marketing. And not that we don't. They don't do it well. It's just getting the word out that there really is a center here, and and uh, you really should go. And there are lots of ways to do that. So that's our that's what we work at the most, and it's like the small committee that we have. But we're like ambassadors. That's part of our job is to go out and and speak about the center and and let people know that it's available and here. So. One more. There we go. So. Um, you know I'm going to end with a story, <laughs> since I always do. Um, I, I retired 15 years ago, and I lived in Tualatin. I'd lived here for a long time, didn't know we had a senior center, because, of course, I'm not a senior at the time. I, I was, but I, didn't, I wouldn't admit it. And uh, believe it or not, uh, it's hard to retire if you haven't yet, and um, when your family has grown and your friends are usually your work friends and all of a sudden you're home with, what do you do? I had no idea. Um, I wasn't as, as much of an extrovert, probably you'd say, as I am now. I was really very, actually very shy. Uh, I will admit that. My, my son will laugh at me when I say that. But um, I heard about the senior center at, um, I don't know where I was, but I, so I went up to him and I said, what is that? And took me about two months to get up the nerve to walk into the senior center and about another month to go back and it was uh, it was a life changer and it wasn't just a life changer for me it was a huge life changer for me I, I wouldn't be sitting here today and as and as much as I love this community and as active as I am in this community if I hadn't been in the senior center to get my feet on the ground and I'm not the only one that that has happened to and that's your story that's your story of all of us in this community who go to the senior center and get revitalized, get healthy, meet people, join in. And the reason we do that is because Ross is head of the department and, and uh, Julie and Heidi, and they're wonderful. But that building is successful because Marilyn and Sarah are there. And uh, we have, and we know that. And it uh, doesn't matter who you are, or what time of the day you walk in that building, you're greeted, you're welcome, the volunteers that work there, Meals on Wheels, uh, even though they're only there two days a week now, uh, are bringing people in. 
it's a jewel in our community, and we're, I, I know how lucky we are, and I know you all know how lucky we are to have them, but um, I just, I had to say it, because I, um, we, need to be, we all need to be reminded of what JPC means to the community. So, so thank you. Questions or comments for Sarah or Susan? Bridget. Um, I think I've said this before. I'm on the younger end of the senior group. <laughs> but um, I have, especially since sitting on city council too, I've taken advantage of going and trying the different programs and a lot of variety just to see what's happening. And I couldn't agree with you more. The, uh, the staff go beyond being de dedicated they're invested mm -hmm. in our community and invested in creating experiences and i just encourage everyone like on city council or let's listening to just take one class i've done tai chi in that um room where we used to have city council mm -hmm. and watch the deer go by as we're doing tai chi um i've gone with counselor Pratt and others on canoe trips and bamboo forest mm -hmm. walks, yeah. which was amazing. The creativity around the programming is um, superb. And I think that there could be a bigger diversity of ages within the age and outside the age um, attending because the programming is so um, really fabulous and worthwhile. So it'd be nice to see. And also, congratulations for peeling yourself off the wall <laughs> as Wallflower and making your way up here. Yeah. And um, and I'm concerned that you might become a pool shark soon. So uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not good. Uh, tempting. <laughs> Council Prisoner Pratt. Well, yeah, I did own all the great stuff that community does. And I know, like, um, for people that retire, the social interaction so important on top of the physical mm -hmm. but the, so we're really um lucky to have such a great center here but i want to give you a little feedback on that the letter sh from santa i uh -huh. did that with my grandkids last year and they were just that was like magic to them because mm -hmm. you know you asked for a few little details about them so it was so specific and it was just like they uh -huh. thought it was the greatest thing ever so that's really nice <laughs> yeah I got another example. I got an email um, from a friend of mine that's a senior that said, um, and she sent me this lady's email, and she just moved into an assisted living in Tualatin, and she didn't know how to get to the senior center. And uh, but they asked me if, if I could give, if I had any information to send her, which I d didn't take much because I just I sent a ride connections number, mm -hmm. told her where ride connection is, you know, this is how you do it. Um, it's free. You know, uh, it was, um, and she emailed me back, the lady that, that um, had asked for the information, and thanked me. Well, it made my day, you know, because I know how hard that is. And um, I write a column for Tualatin Life uh, called Aging in Place, and four times a year I do resources in Tualatin. And uh, JPC and Rye Connection are at the, at the top, and then the library, and we, and we go down. Uh, but um, the community needs to know. Other questions, Soraya's. Um, um, thank you for the report. I um, just want to thank also Juanita Paul and, and the staff there for allowing Pili Group on Saturdays. It's a Spanish speaking for uh, women. It's a women's group that meets there on Saturdays, and they have uh, also fitness and Zumba classes mm -hmm. and other other activities, which you know. Mm -hmm. Um, reach out to the community to say it's completely in Spanish, which is great for that population as well, that feel um, included when, mm -hmm. when they come to this group. So thank you very much for that. I just want to make sure that that is highlighted and uh, that people know that there are um, other groups that meet there that are also doing similar uh, support to senior women in general, mm -hmm. but it's, there's a lot of women mm -hmm. from different ages. Um, I do have a, a, I'm just curious about the budget because you do such a great program and um, you have, we want to make sure that you're, you're, you continue there. How, how, how do you get funded? And are you a 501c status or are you uh, just part of the recs, parks and recs? I think people, it would be good for the community to know that. Well, part of parks and rec and taxpayer 
and money is what funds us mainly. Um, I'm not even sure if I know a 40501. I was going to ask you that three. question. No, we are, we are number two. No, they're not. They're Good evening, Council. Judy Ludeman, Recreation Manager. Um, yeah, the Pulse Center is funded as general fund, mm -hmm. primarily with the Recreation Department. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, the reason I, I ask if it was a 501c3 is because of donations. So I always try to make that call for action right. for people mm -hmm. to make contributions. Yeah, and you yeah. can um, donate or sponsor programs. We always mm -hmm. are happy to receive any of that to do it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Well, thank you both. Uh, like Susan, you said that Sarah and Marilyn do an outstanding job mm -hmm. at the Pole Center. And she said, every time I go in there, just you know, as soon as you walk through the door, someone sits at the desk with a smile and hello. There's always someone playing pool, no matter what time you go in there. Um, and that I get tremendous feedback from folks at the Veterans Breakfast. I, uh, I'm amazed at your ability to get donations for that event. <laughs> I mean, it's one of the events that has so many um, giveaways, mm -hmm. and your ability to go get those are, is tremendous. And then I also uh, hear a lot from seniors who, you know, the Meals on Wheels is, was very is still very much appreciated. Mm -hmm. It's convenient and it's social, um, so I think it's super important. Many of us have done a couple, three meals a year and just to check in and see how things are going, uh, but. You know, the two of you do an outstanding job as well, Susan, at the Pulse Center. I can't say enough how great you're doing. Thank you. Right. We love it. All right. <laughs> All right. Oh, what? Don's got a hand up. <laughs> Good evening. I thought I would answer Councillor Reyes's question about being a 501c3. <laughs> Thank uh, you. So we are not a 501c3, though we are nonprofit. We're not under the 501c3. So any donations that were made to us are are not are uh, tax deductible, and we could provide a letter if needed. Okay, thank you. Don's always hovering above us. <laughs> oh, thank you for both coming tonight. Pops it. All right. That brings us to our second special report, an outside agency grant awardee, uh, the 12th and Food Pantry. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Mayor Lubnick and city councilors for having us today. My name is Danielle Schneider, and I'm the executive director of the 12th and Food Pantry. Why not, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> um, and this is Mike Schiffer. He's our outgoing uh, board chair, and he's one of the founders of the pantry. Um, so we're going to give a short report today about the impact um, that the grant funds have had on the work that we do at the pantry, and just share a little bit about, if you've never been to the pantry, kind of what you experience there. Um, can I point at either screen? Just Hopefully it'll work, okay. because people are struggling today. Let's see. Um, so we are a community organized food pantry and we're an official partner of the partner agency of the Oregon Food Bank, which allows us to access additional resources um, that would not otherwise be available to us through that stream. Um, we operate, there's a little typo there, so hopefully that's okay. We operate with um, a paid staff of just under, uh, it's around 2.8, uh, I think it's 2.8 actually. Um, so there's three part-time people that work, myself as a part-time executive director, and then we have two folks that manage the pantry, one is our pantry coordinator and the other is our uh, warehouse coordinator. We have a dedicated team of regular and occasional volunteers. Um, on a given year, we will typically have about 10,000 volunteer annual hours annually, which equates to just under uh, five full-time employees. So without the support of volunteers from our community, we would not be able to operate the programs that we operate. We have five. 5,000 square feet of space in the lower level of the Rolling Hills Community Church. Um, we do pay rent to the church. We're not affiliated with them. Um, however, they give us a, a very good uh, discount. We would not be able to afford a similar space at market rate. So we're very fortunate to the contribution they make in that regard. Clients can access our services uh, 13 hours a week. And we have volunteers on site that are there five days a week, um, four days are for the client service, and then on the fifth day is when we receive the donation from the food bank and volunteers sort that out and put it away. And we serve individuals that reside in five areas, so Durham, Lake Oswego, Tualatin, Westland, and Wilsonville. 
um, with our highest number of folks are, come from the city of Tomlinson. Um, so when clients show up, we consider ourselves to be a low barrier service provider. So we operate from the philosophy that if someone comes to our facility and says that they are in need of food assistance, that we want to provide that with as little um, paperwork and asking, uh, you know, kind of personal questions as possible. Um, so we do ask clients to provide that they um, that they live in one of our service areas, and that's really because the demand in the community has gone from such like um, I was hired two years ago. We were serving about 350 households per month, and we are currently serving around 850. And so when the demand was less, we were able to be a little bit more flexible about where we served folks from. Um, as the demand has increased, and it just increases every month, um, we have had to scale back that flexibility because we want to make sure that we have the resources for the folks um, that reside in those five communities. We will also show, uh, serve anyone who is unhoused and resides in our service area. So that can be folks who are um, living unhoused for long term in the community, and we do have probably like 15 or so folks of those a, a month that we serve on a regular basis that our volunteers and staff get to know, um, or just folks that find themselves transitioning from one place to another and lacking housing. Um, when clients show up, they receive a number, um, and then they're checked in in order for, of that number, and they shop through our pantry just like you would at the grocery store. So they grab a shopping cart. Um, many of our shopping carts come from Fred Meyer, so it's like a grocery store experience. Um, we have bags and boxes available for them to put their items in. Um, and then they go through the pantry and they shop based on a color-coded system. Um, so we have small, medium, and large families. All of the stations throughout our pantry have um, little indicators that say what you can take from that section based on the size of a household that you have. Um, when we have plenty of things, you know, we do make them unlimited, but there are certain things that we have to put a, um, a quantity on because we just don't have an unlimited supply. And, Often those are the things that we're purchasing. Um, we strive to have three or four people kind of shopping at a time so it doesn't get too bottlenecked. While we do have a big space, we also have a lot of things in there and so it can be a little um, tight if we have more folks than that shopping in our pantry. Um, so as I said earlier, and um, the number of folks that we are serving has increased. Um, so in 2022, we served 8,195 households. In 2023, we served over 10, almost uh, 10,300 households. So a huge increase in the number of households, um, but also in the number of people that we're serving. So in 2022, um, we were serving uh, just over 27,000 folks. And in 2023, it was nearly 35,000 individuals. Um, so two things that we have seen as um, the as we've recovered out of COVID, the ending of the federal allotments for staff that were related to COVID um, stopped. And so that spiked demand in the number of people coming because there was, um, the federal government was stopped putting the additional SNAP benefits um, onto cards. And then as the uh, eviction moratorium um, expired, we also saw a lot more large families, which typically is an indicator that people are living doubled up in a household when you start seeing seven, eight, nine, ten people in a household um, that typically is more than one family together. Um, so both of those things increased um, from just as we were checking people in, things that we noticed, um, but just the overall growth in the number of folks visiting us. Um, and that Every month we think, okay, this month is going to be the month that it like declines, and it doesn't. Um, we did see a little bit of a dip in the month of December, which I think is attributed to the fact that there's a lot more community programs available for folks in December. We were also closed three days with the holidays, so that impacts you know the number of shoppers. But um, overall, the, the number has been trending upward, and um, I think we all certainly can hope that it will soon start to go back down. And we do have uh, a special guest here with us tonight. So as I said, uh, Mike is the one of the co-founders of The Pantry. Um, so Mike, Linda, and Kay uh, started The Pantry um, coming together to fill a need that was identified in the community. Um, this will be our 20th year. Um, and from that has grown uh, an amazing operation full of dedicated 
volunteers and uh, people that come together to serve the community. And just as the folks before us were talking about the volunteers that we have at the food pantry are really people who are incredibly special. We have a dedicated crew of 30 folks who come on a weekly basis. Like they show up like it's their job. Like they have these shifts and they're there every single time that we have a shift um, and do all kinds of different things. Like someone was shoveling ice off of the walk the other day so people can get in or picking up uh, large food donations staying late because the Cisco truck doesn't arrive on time with our milk. So um, there's all kinds of things that they pitch in and do. And that's really from the, the culture that Mike and Linda and Kate created when they started the pantry to serve the community. Um, so we just want to express our appreciation uh, to Mike and for all of the things that he has brought to our community. Um, and we'd be happy to take any questions that you might have about our pantry. I'm going to open the floor to Mike first before we okay. do questions. Yeah, um, I can't come to a city council meeting and not talk. Um, and one of my favorite things to talk about is the food pantry. When Linda and Kay and I took over the leadership of this effort almost 20 years ago, we had no idea if we would even succeed a little bit. Um, we have this great space right now in the basement of Rolling Hills Church, but some of you may know that we started in the basement of the old Tualatin Elementary School. Mm -hmm. Thus, we called ourselves Tualatin Schoolhouse Pantry. Uh, and then that was deemed unsafe for a food pantry and other things. And the Tiger Tualatin School District was kind enough to give us space in portable buildings. Um, we started out, we didn't know what we were doing. Our dream was to make it a shopping experience for people. And in the past, five years that it's begun that become that. Uh, you know, we have great volunteers, we have great leadership, but really the success of the pantry is due to the whole community. Mm -hmm. The community from the beginning, uh, the city, uh, the businesses have been so supportive, it's incredible. Um, we would love to do a lot more, but what we've done so far, we've done basically just by people knowing that we exist. And it humbles me to be part of a community that is so generous and so supportive of people who really need this help. So it's, an, it's been an honor for me to serve in this capacity and I'm really proud of what we've accomplished, what we've all accomplished, and what's gonna continue to happen at the, at the pantry, so thank you. So questions for Danielle or Mike? That's President Pratt. Well, I just, you know, sometimes numbers are just numbers up there, but um, I mean, I know you serve outside of Tualatin in this general area, but you're serving like 10% of Tualatin's population every month. That's amazing. Yeah, it, it's, um, it's, yeah, it's a lot. It's every, you know, every time we go, it's, there's a line of people waiting to come in and wow. get service. <laughs> An another thing related to that is it's not an obvious need to many people. When we first started, they said, we don't need a big food pantry and toilet, and we don't have that need. Well, we do, and you just don't see it. So uh, thank goodness there are places like toilet and food pantry and other local pantries that can fill that need. Other questions? Mr. Hillier. I don't have a question, I have more of a comment. I think um, your last point is so spot on about it's not seen. And I think the opportunity that it's given our youth, I know the high school does a whole bunch of drives. They, I know a lot of kids who volunteer there and that's part of their, um, who they are to give back to their community and to see a different lens for our community. And I know that you welcome them with, with open arms, but I also think how you work with the high school students, and I'm sure it's more than just what I know about Tualatin High School, it's probably happening in these other communities as well. But giving them an opportunity to serve in their community, even just by advertising a, a food drive yeah. is something really important. And I think that that's um, part of the culture that you've helped cultivate and create and, and makes our community such an extra special place. So thank you. Um, I just wanna ask if people 
would like to volunteer or donate food or money, how would they do that? Yes. <laughs> um, so you can go to our brand new, newly designed website. It's Tualatin. Uh, foodpantry.org and um, there's multiple ways from there to get involved so we have a donate button where you can make a contribution we are a registered 501c3 um, so you'll receive a, a receipt to do the tax deduction and all of that um, and then the food the money the funds that come in help support the operation of the pantry we are entirely funded by individual donations and uh, grants um, so we don't have any fee for service or other revenue streams um, if you would like to volunteer with us, um, there's two different options. One, we have drop-in volunteers on an ad hoc basis. There's a button that says get involved, and if you click that, um, it'll take you to our online volunteer sign up and you can select a date. Or your um, company or you as a council, if you wanted to come, um, you could email us and we can work out a date for you to come and volunteer as a group in the pantry. The online sign up is, I think, restricted to like two people per shift, and so when we have uh, groups of folks who come and volunteer together, we adjust it on the back end to make it work. Um, but we have lots of companies who do that um, um, as like team building. Lamb Research is one that sends frequent groups of, of employees out to our location. So um, if ever there's a date and time that you're like, oh, I really want to volunteer on that day, but it's full, just email us and we'll, <laughs> we'll figure it out. Um, and then the third way is to host a community food drive. So um, in addition to the funds that we have to buy food, we also rely heavily on uh, food drives that are done throughout the community, and those can be done, um, as Cindy pointed out, we have um, the high school kids that do them very frequently through their school. Um, we also have elementary kids that do them, which is just super cute. Um, and then uh, businesses will do them, but even we've had neighborhoods or one of our volunteers um, had a birthday party, and so his birthday party recommendation was like, if you're coming, you have to bring canned food for the um, food pantry. We do have large barrels that um, we can bring to you if you would like to have one um, hosted in a, a business or community center or things like that. Um, and that you can email through the website as well and we can help get that set up. So, yeah, thank you. Council Brooks. I just wanna, um, well, first of all, thank you for your leadership in helping fund this found this and um, <clears throat> there's a thing about when people see a need and are activated and I don't know exactly what the motivation is but I'm grateful that it, it was stirred in you um, in my experience as a social worker I know how important people being their basic needs of eating and being fed is so important about the way that people can function and succeed in other ways and feel better. And, um, and it is kind of astounding that we have in our country such a problem with hunger. And uh, they did a really good presentation at the last NLC conference we were at around national concerns about it, but also um, some of it is the lack of will. So community groups and what you guys are doing is really appreciated and supported. And I also wanna thank all the board members too that um, take their time and uh, stay out of trouble by, uh, by participating with the organization. And I'm glad that we're supporting you and thank you so much for serving our community. Thank you. Welcome. Well, it's my pleasure um, to recognize Mike, you know, 20 years plus of service to Walton uh, Food Pantry. So we have the certificate to recognize your efforts. The city of Tualatin gratefully recognizes Mike Schiffer, co-founder of the Tualatin Schoolhouse Pantry, now known as the Tualatin Food Pantry, for his dedication, leadership, and outstanding record of community service in reducing hunger and food insecurity in Tualatin and our surrounding communities. January 22nd, 2024. Come on up, Mike. Congratulations. I think it's gonna do the photo thing. <laughs> Thank you very Wait, much. Wait, one more. Oh, one more. Danielle wants to get one. <laughs>
That brings us to general business. General business item number one. Uh, consideration of the planning division work plan for fiscal years 2023-24 and 2024-25. Steve and Aaron, welcome. Good evening, Mayor and Council. That was uh, certainly a hard act to follow, very moving. I'm Steve Cooper, Assistant Community Development Director, and I'm joined by Aaron Engman, Senior Planner, and I'll have to, excuse me, I'm getting over, losing my voice, so I'll uh, try to speak sparingly, and Aaron will give a lot of the presentation tonight. Um, before we get into the long-range planning work plan, I just want to reintroduce who we are and the work that we do. Uh, the Planning Division is part of the Community Development Department. We are small but mighty and consist of me, the Assistant Community Development Director, Aaron, our Senior Planner. We have Keith, our Associate Planner, Madeline, our Assistant Planner, and Lindsay, our Office Coordinator. <clears throat> and this photo is actually from our volunteer event, although after that last presentation, we've been talking internally about another volunteer event, and so I think that's definite, a definite possibility of the Walton Food Bank. So just a brief overview of what we do. Um, first and foremost, uh, we do current planning, and so current planning is kind of what you think of as uh, planning, kind of stereotypical, manning the planning counter, responding to citizen inquiries, and processing land use applications. Long-range planning is forward-looking um, and involves implementing projects like code or map op updates broadly in the city. We also support the council's housing policy goals and as part of our compliance with statewide planning goals around public involvement, we act as liaison to two volunteer committees, the Planning Commission and Architectural Review Board, and we also coordinate with community development organizations and their land use officers. This slide is an overview of our land use applications from the last fiscal year. We saw 219 total. This is, for reference, a slight increase over the prior year. Um, one thing to point out here is that we do not control how many applications we receive and particularly how complex and time-consuming they may be. Thinking back to the Norwood application, that certainly was a doozy. <clears throat> <laughs> And due to legal requirements and mandated timelines, land use applications form as a division our primary priority, and we do our long-range planning and other work with our remaining staff capacity. As mentioned, responding to citizen and community calls and emails is another part of our current planning function. <clears throat> As we've been tracking this data for almost two years now, we've actually started to notice a trend um, where we see a higher number of inquiries in the first half of the year, uh, which then drops off in the latter half of the year. This, to some extent, follows the planning process, which is, has land use applications and pre-development activity earlier in the calendar year, and then uh, the process shifts over to the development review and building portion in the summer months, and then tapers off as we get into the holidays and the wet weather season. Similar to land use applications, we do not control the volume or complexity or time that we spend responding to these inquiries, but in order to maintain Tualatin's reputation for excellent customer service, this is also a priority for our staff. As the council heads into its next advance coming up, we after next, I believe, um, we see a very full list of 2023 priorities, many of which are implemented by or in partnership with other departments by the Community Development Department and the Planning Division. <clears throat> Throughout the development of our work plan, we use these council priorities as a North Star. As you'll see on the next slide, we've proposed a work plan that will move this important work forward in a way that balances the aspirations shown with available staff capacity and budget. Our goal is to make these priorities a reality while living within our means. 
One thing I do want to emphasize is that while the work plan is developed based on what we think we heard from previous conversations with council, we can certainly make adjustments as needed. It's by no means set in stone. And with that, I'll now turn it over to Aaron, who will walk you through the proposed work plan and help explain the why and how. Thanks, Steve. At our last conversation, we heard that council favored a two-year work program. Oh, I guess I should advance the slide. So as shown on this slide, staff proposes a plan that focuses our efforts on projects that are legally mandated, such as the CFAC parking code, which we'll talk at our next agenda item, um, projects that are ongoing, such as our housing production strategy implementation and our transportation system plan, and those that are ready to be implemented, or as we like to call them, low-hanging fruit, and that includes some of our adoption-ready stormwater master plan and the Basalt Creek Parks master plan. And then to build on top of that, staff also proposes a bundle of, um, excuse me, I'm trying to find my space, a grouping of code updates that staff can be accomplished with existing resources, time, and um, our, our budget constraints. This approach attempts to balance the projects that are easy to implement and those that align with council's priorities. Um, and then you'll see this also preserves other projects in a parking lot for council prioritization when the next two-year work plan period is reviewed in 2025. I also wish to share that staff did experiment with the scoring rubric and we confirmed that mid to long-term priority projects scored better than those projects identified as short-term priorities, and that was based off their greater community impact, which is understandable. That said, all identified projects provide some level of community benefit while also supporting council priorities. So now I wish to move on to our short-term projects that we've identified, and these include pickball use in general commercial zoning, cannabis hours of operation, durable goods sales in central commercial, and electronic vehicle sales in mixed use commercial. Um, these projects are fairly easy to implement and bundle nicely together. All of these projects support comprehensive plan goal 4.2 to support business retention, growth, and attraction. Because this project does not include sweeping impacts to the city, we anticipate that the adoption process will be fairly straightforward and include the typical legislative steps. Based on our workloads, we anticipate this project can be accomplished within four to six months. And I have a, a project example here with our recent Canvas Code update. Um, you'll see that the stars align for this project and we were able to use many staff in an all hands on deck approach. Um, because of this, uh, the various milestones and uh, items that go forward with a, a code update and adoption took approximately four months, which is fairly accelerated for a project of this size. Looking ahead to potential projects in 2025, we've identified some good projects, which we've categorized as midterm projects. You'll see that this includes food carts, the tree code update, or potentially increasing density. Um, you'll also see that these projects support comprehensive plan policies, and some also um, support our climate action plan um, work. In the future, staff will be able to provide an update on potential funding sources, staff availability, and a recommendation for prioritization. Just go back. So I just wanted to provide an example of what a midterm project schedule could look like. Um, using our mixed use commercial project code to provide an example. Um, the project complexity and the staff resources for this project um, typically takes 10 months to a year to complete. Many projects of this scale require the help of a consultant and involve many city staff. Um, they also require greater levels of public outreach. Um, 
Moving on, we've also identified some good long-term projects to consider in the future. Depending on staff resources, there may be some opportunities to combine and synergize some of the midterm and long-term projects. As an example, it can make sense to look at the increased density project and the downtown visioning project in tandem. So there's some good synergy there. When we're looking at these longer term projects, uh, of course, they typically take more staff resources. Um, they may involve some funding resources too to hire some consultant expertise. And because of their public engagement process, these code updates could take up to two years or longer. So something to think about in the future. And with that, I'll close with um, staff respectfully re requests that can, excuse me, I'm all tongue tied. I haven't left the house in 10 days, this is hard. <laughs> um, staff respectfully requests council's acceptance of the planning division work plan for fiscal year 2023 and 24, as well as 24 and 25. And then for our next steps, staff would return at a future work session, which we've ten tentatively identified as February 26, to map out the process, timelines, and other details for these short-term projects that were identified. And then of course, we would return in early 2025 to have the conversation again and look at our work plan for the future. So with that, I'll pause and open it up to questions or comments from council. Questions, comments? Council Brooks and Council President Pratt. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I just first want to acknowledge um, when, when people are used to working one way and then shift it up and um, shift to do it a new way, it takes effort and ingenuity and um, collaboration in your team so I just appreciate the time and you too also just specifically um, take the time in the evening hours to come talk to us um, I, pro I think I probably know you the best out of everybody at mm -hmm. the at, in the department so I just want to thank you for coming out um, and get th and getting out of the house after the break um, I also wanted to um, acknowledge the the way that I see the the plan which is really helpful um, how you organize the plan to uh, synergize with each other how you organize the plan to keep in mind and utilize new things that we're doing with the city um, I don't have a lot of juggling. I think that's an internal management thing. And I also think that that flexibility piece sticks with me because you just don't know. Like we, we don't know when we're gonna get, we get them too, lots of emails about a specific thing. Um, but what we do know is what we can do to kind of ease our way through that and sitting on um, other committees with members from other cities that just have stepped down from their elected positions and a lot of it has to do with land use decisions and the way that we listen to the community. I just want to thank you for taking the time and making the effort to make sure that our community feels heard because what's going on around us in not just one city but various cities has a lot to do with the relationship between the community and the city and the city council. So that helps make my job easier. Um, you always are bringing the information that we're curious about. You're willing to be flexible, change strategy, um, and have some pieces that have come directly from the community to, for us to consider and for, for, that you guys work on, which no one plans for. So that ability to pivot and be um, accommodating um, to our community and keep those assessments flexible. I just want to appreciate that. Thanks. Thank you. Well, well I echo that the work you put into this is great and the having, I love the project timeline because <laughs> it's just a nice visual. Um, my question is on 
the short-term projects, um, where do those come from? Because one of those I've never heard of, so I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> so these are projects that have been identified by our business stakeholders or the community groups at large where we've been approached as staff or maybe we've heard from our city manager um, that this is a, a need or a concern within some business groups. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's correct, is that, that we've had a number, and some of them are carried over from things that we've heard in the past, and some of them are a little bit newer, but knowing that we were having this opportunity, and again, providing outreach to the community and talking to folks, once people are aware that this exercise was going on, we heard from some new people. Okay, and so like two of these we've had brought before council, so what would the the typical process, would you come to us in a work session and kind of give us background and look so, for direction? Um, so I think what we're looking for this evening is acceptance of the work plan. I think some level of council consensus that the bundle of projects is the right bundle of projects. And then if so, we would return with more details about each of those projects that are part of the short-term bundle. If there was one or more that the council did not want us to proceed with, then we obviously would not put more effort into that. And so at this point, we're just presenting it to you okay. as something that we could possibly come back with and map out in greater detail the process for changing the code okay. for those four areas. Yeah, it's kind of, I feel like it's a, um, it's hard to give direction on something we know nothing about. <laughs> So, but we know you've got community input about it. Correct, and I think the answer is is that if it's looking at it, it's a hard no, as it were, that it's not something that you want us to provide you more briefing on that you're not even open to, then we want to know that. But if yeah. you're open to it and then want to make a further decision at the work session, then okay. that's also okay. That makes sense. Thank you. <laughs> that was my question. <laughs> yeah, the, the durable goods. Yeah. Well, I the electric vehicle sales and mixed use commercial. I'm probably okay with that one. But the durable goods sales and central commercial. I'm not sure that's something I'm really interested in. So. Yeah. The uh, and Steve can describe it a little bit more. We've been approached for a long time about filling the Hagen's shopping center, the, the empty Hagen's center. And that property manager, uh, Zydell, has um, a flooring um, company that is on the hook that it, uh, like linoleum flooring and, and all kinds of like design, interior design, and our code designates that as durable good sales, and it's not allowed. And um, we know that you have made it a priority to, uh, you, we get asked a lot of like, how, when are we gonna fill that site? When are we gonna fill that site? And um, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to us um, that the, like a tile and a, like durable goods, like design, think of like the design section in Home Depot, um, that that wouldn't be allowed in that in that area, so we don't know the rationale okay. behind why it wasn't there. Well, that puts it in context. Yeah, I'm okay. With and then um, the at, at Bridgeport or in in our um, mixed use commercial, um, think of the uh, Tesla showroom at Washington Square, where it's more of a showroom. Um, they the Bridgeport would like to have, an, it's not the, tes, the Tesla, but it is another electric company that they would just like to have a showroom, but that's not allowed either. Okay. Dr. Sacco. Thank you. Um, just a quick clarification on the timeline of the uh, short-term bundle. Um, so the short-term bundle includes the pickleball, cannabis hours, durable goods, electrical vehicle, um, and it's slated for Q3 and Q4. Um, so is that all the work to be done during that time period or is that like starting during that time period? So, I mean, I think the way, it's a little bit hard to fit exact dates within the right. kind of rough uh, guidelines of the work plan. But I mean, essentially what we're envisioning would be to come back at the second meeting in February with essentially details for how we would do it and then we would basically launch into the project from there if we receive council direction and move forward. 
And so essentially from, I mean, it's four to six months from that date where we receive direction to go forward from. Okay. So I guess, you know, seven to five months from now. Right? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, so I would propose to make your work even easier by removing the cannabis hours of operation from this bundle. And um, my reasons are partially that I was not here to have the discussion. It was very strategically, in my personal opinion, brought up uh, to be discussed when I was not here. And um, we heard from many community, compelling uh, community members and our business community why it is so important to have um, this medical opportunity available for people. But um, I don't know how many people in here have a prescription that you pick up yourself. I, I pick up several. I'm a caregiver for other people, including my dog who can't go get his prescription on his own. And his prescriptions are at Costco. Costco's pharmacy, for instance, is open from 10 a.m. to 8.30 p.m. on Monday through Saturday, and it's closed on Sundays. They have a lunch hour, they have, you know, things like that. Fred Meyer Pharmacy, for instance, is uh, Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m., Saturday from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., Sunday from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., also closed for lunch. I also pick up things at a compounding pharmacy around, around the corner, and their hours are Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., Saturday only for uh, pickup from 9 to 1, and they're closed on Sunday. Also, I'd like to point out the liquor store hours um, are Monday through Thursday, 10 a.m. to 8 p.m., Friday from 10 a.m. to 9 p.m., Sunday, 11 to 6. The reason that I bring up um, their hours is um, because I think it's a comparison because that's what was brought before this body is very specifically discussing uh, people's needs to pick up prescriptions as caregivers. I'd also like to say that um, I am very concerned about what the norms in our community are for our youth and for our families. And unfortunately, I am an empty nester and I have way too many pictures of my dog on my telephone, so it was very difficult for me to find the many pictures that I possess of the um, person from um, the cannabis dispensary that is currently in our community, which I will also point out that many, many community members, if we want to talk about community input, testified before this body about not having one allowed at all, and then what the boundaries were going to be. And this body chose to change the boundaries, which allowed this dispensary in, okay, and with these set hours, which was a protective factor in our community. But when we have pictures of the guy with the weed sign, which is a best practice when you look into cannabis and marijuana dispensary, the weed guy, the sign spinning around everywhere, and he's on our freeway here, he's down you know, at the Bridgeport exit, well, that is a norm that now can start at 7 a.m. Our kids are going to school, our people, like, until 10 o'clock at night. I think that the hours that um, are of operation from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. are absolutely what they need to be, and I don't think there is a need for any change in the hours, and I think it's up to this body to recognize that there were many, many community members who did not want to have this the way it is now in our community, and because the business community has brought this to us, um, we've responded, and okay, but what about the community members that we represent? I'd like, I'd like them to be represented tonight, and I would like to have this removed. And I do have statistics with me also, if you'd like to talk about the perception of harm for marijuana use for 6th, 8th, and 11th graders, which has plummeted since 2020 and even before. Um, and, and I just think that this is a bad decision for our community. So aren't these, you're going to come back at the second meeting in February with the list of things and plans and that's from Council Hillier. When we have a vote on it, right now we're looking at your timeline, but there are specific items you want out or someone wants out 
Would that be the discussion you're looking forward to in February? It, it could tonight? be it could be tonight or it could be in February. I mean, also I think I would just kind of reiterate some of the slides that Aaron walked through is, is that there will be opportunities for community mm -hmm. input as part of that four to six month process as well. Um, and so there's you know, it's not it's not it's an iterative process where it's not done until council finally adopts an ordinance. Okay. And so I think it's just a matter of if we're really sure that we don't want to direct staff resources in this direction, then we'd like to know that, um, okay. you know, up front. And if it turns out to be that the council is unsure about that and then gets, you know, widespread community feedback and decides that we don't, we started moving forward with it and we don't want to move forward with it, we're prepared to kind of do any of the above. All right. So does anyone... Um Align or agree with Council Hillier to have it taken out tonight, or would you prefer to February to talk about it? What's the preference of the group, Councilor Sakov? Um, I would prefer to keep it on and discuss further. Okay. Others? I do too. Okay. Right, I do as well. Okay. All right. So we'll keep it on for now, but it's certainly more discussion in February about it. Other questions or comments? Council Brooks. I had one more as I was thinking through. Um, when I, I keep thinking about some of the different um, language, and I feel like we're building out pretty quickly, but different language that other cities have around directions of roofs and, and things like that. Um, I'm just curious when we look at the environmental um, planning for build outs. Um, if I know that we're in the highlight, it was a concentration, but I of um, building. Does that make sense? Density, Density. Yeah. not concentration, <laughs> unless it's orange juice. Um, a density of buildings, but I'm just curious if there's other. Um, pieces around that that's included with the looking at the pl the code as well or if it's just um, density by itself I think as shared as a midterm priority project that it was just density itself I think that um, as Aaron noted that there is potential synergies with other um, projects I think in particular what comes to mind is that the um, uh, you know, a thorough code overhaul that we mentioned as a longer term project that some of the sh the mid or kind of shorter term code projects could be a springboard for then a more comprehensive um, look at the code. And so we'd have to, I mean, that would be part of what we would want council feedback on is whether or not the scope of certain code updates should broaden. And then, you know, part of our role is to help you figure out, you know, are we getting into all of a sudden this is much more than we can uh, we've bit off more than we can chew at this point or not. And so that's, I think, what we look forward to as part of our future conversation when we get into more details about those items. And then I want to follow up with that, too, is um, when we think about, like, when I think about, um, like, say, EV chargers and garages or whatever, um, ways of incentivizing behavior versus coding behavior. Um, and when we're looking at the planning document in general about uh, research and analysis and how it works together with, um, you know, working with other departments or whatever with the, with what, in, what incentives are out there or, you know, what's actually um, feasible. I'm just curious if like research, I don't know, if, I don't know if we call it research and development, but research or um, if that's, embedded anywhere in the planning because I think it's hard for long-term planning. We look at the operational side of it, but the pieces around um, the innovative pieces, I'm just curious how that's um, demonstrated. Yeah. No, that's a great question. I think, I mean, I think the answer is, is that in many of the code projects that we've worked on, we have included an element of analysis so by way of example the basalt creek employment included an economic analysis and so that's an example of research to inform what our practice might be and so that's you know a mid 
mid size to large size effort. Whereas for some of the other, you know, smaller code efforts, we might not have the budget scope and kind of timeline to incorporate that much of a wider look. And so that would that would vary depending on the project. But I think that in general, that is a good practice. And like if we were to do, say, a complete code overhaul, a code audit um, to identify what existing code is compared to best practices and current research trends and things like, things like that, I think in our minds would be certainly a large part of that type of project. And then to back up on that one with the something like the Climate Action Plan, how does your department um, like work with the research that's done on that when there, there's development going on from the department that's working on that? plan that affects your department? I mean, I, I think that part of the climate action plan is it's like many of the documents that we have to work with. And so it's partly balancing all of the different competing priorities and figuring out where council direction lands on it. And so as with everything, you know, by way of another example, we're going through the transportation system plan update. That's one of our ongoing projects. And so we're also using the climate action plan, even though it's still in draft form, as a lens by which we examine the updates that we're gonna be making to it. And so from this point forward, and you notice peppered through some of the slides, we've identified alignment with specific climate action plan policies. That's, I mean, we're assuming that we're treating it as though the plan will be adopted ultimately. And that's another lens that we'll view future projects through. And as much as possible, we're trying to do the work of moving that plan forward where it aligns with our other projects. Okay, because I just think, especially with the fact that we, not only what we can touch as a city, but also what the impact is from buildings, it's just particularly, it was particularly surprising to me and then particularly um, impactful in, in especially long range um, planning efforts in ways that we can I, I would like to see us incentivize as much as we can instead of, you know, uh, um, a lot more for carrots and sticks. So thank you. Thank you. I'm wondering with the short session coming up, if um, you get another unfunded, <laughs> unfunded mandate from the state, like CFAF, um, will there be enough timeline that that will go beyond the two-year timeline we're looking at to well now to you now you jinxed us <laughs> yeah i know <laughs> no i'm kidding um i mean hopefully not i think is the answer our experience has been you know and we're going to talk about our cfac item next we've done i think a good job of um you know where we need more time applying for extensions and trying as best as we can to kind of balance, again, going back to this idea of, you know, we have limited staff, we're working within our means, and so part of that is communicating. And so far, although, I mean, obviously, I think that we probably share the same opinion about unfunded mandates, <laughs> I think that DLC has been overall fairly responsive in, like, extending timelines and things and allowing us to at least, like, keep our work that we're already doing going. Um, and so that's... I guess I'm I mean, I, I just, th I think so far what I've seen, there's been a lot of thought put into that. So that means there's probably a lot of time put into it also, and you have limited staff. Yes. So. I mean, I, I'm, I'm cautiously, cautiously optimistic as far as the next two years and as far as the work plan that's under consideration tonight. I do have a little bit of pause in thinking about how it's going to affect future council priorities. And so when we come back to you in 2025, the conversation may be a little bit different, but I mean... I don't, don't know what the tea leaves say at this right. point. Okay. Other questions or comments? Uh, just two things. One, refresh my memory on the stormwater master plan. I can't remember. It's a blur as far as on Basalt Creek. Did we, did we finish the Basalt Creek water plan? Remember we had to pull it apart from our main plan. Is this the one you're talking about or is that done? Yeah. <laughs> or is that, because I don't see it there. I remember we had to pull up. When, so it, it, it was it, it ultimately the whole plan came to a halt right due to the basalt creek right. um, specific issues and so um, more work was done subsequent to that and so that is kind of what makes it in a status status that is adoption ready and so 
we've actually been kind of incrementally doing some additional work, um, Aaron and I as a team, in the background. And so although we kind of showed it in the work plan as occurring a little bit later, if we can get a little bit more lane where we have a little breather, depending on how this short-term projects kind of play out, we're going to try to come back to you like spring or summer with a work session to talk about next steps on those projects and give you a little bit more information and refresh your memory and kick out the cobwebs because right. I feel the same way. Because, but that is the stormwater master plan part of that. One in the same. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. I wasn't losing it. I was going. Oof. And then going with Council President Pratt's discussion or her fear of the short session. You know, all the mayors are hearing about the son of HB 3414. So something's going to come out of this short session that's going to mess up your plan. I hate to jinx you, but we'll see. Because the governor is working it hard to get the votes in legislature to get it passed this time. So we'll see. See what she comes out with. But we all know it's one of her top, it is our only priority. So, okay. Any other questions? All right. Thank you for that. Are you both up for their next item or just Steve? Yeah. Or? Yeah. Okay. Would you like us to switch seats or? <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, so again, Steve Cooper, Assistant Community Development Director, joined by Aaron Engman, Senior Planner. Um, I'm gonna turn this over for the bulk of the presentation to Aaron. I think I just wanna preface our conversation tonight with the fact that this uh, climate-friendly and equitable communities, particularly this parking section of the legislation, is really complicated, and I don't necessarily profess to even be the expert on it myself. Aaron has kind of been thrown into the furnace and had to become the expert. And so I just want to kind of applaud her efforts to do so. We've tried to present this to you in a way that is simple to understand, but that in some ways wasn't wholly possible. And so apologize in advance for providing some of the jargony stuff that just kind of comes along with the territory. Um, but we're happy to be here to serve as a resource to kind of walk you through anything that um, we didn't do a good job explaining up front. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Aaron. Thanks, Steve. So um, now that I got my cobwebs loosened up with the last presentation, hopefully I can slow down and be thoughtful with this complicated one. Um, so to set the stage for tonight's discussion, we'll start with a summary of what CFAC is and some of the context behind the history of parking requirements. We'll then transition into a description of various policy requirements and a review of the project schedule. And then we will conclude with an opportunity to address questions before a council will be asked to accept our staff recommendation. Um, so as background, the CFAC or Climate Friendly and Equitable Communities mandate requires that Tualatin as well as other cities in the metropolitan regions throughout the state, update their land use regulations and transportation plans to encourage a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. For the Portland metro area, the greenhouse gas emission reduction target is 20% by 2035 and 35% by 2050. While the CFAC mandates also require updates to our land use regulations and the TSP, Tonight's conversation is centered on our updates to our vehicle parking regulations. For background, I thought it might be helpful to share that the minimum parking requirements in our code aren't necessarily an exact science. They have been historically established by surveying nearby cities and consulting with transportation engineer handbooks. Because the standards aren't established by market demand studies, some parking areas tend to get overbuilt, as you might notice. It could also be helpful to share that minimum parking standards can become a regulatory barrier for some local businesses. As tenant spaces turn over at existing shopping centers, minimum parking requirements need to be reevaluated under our current system. We found that this can be particularly difficult for restaurant uses as they have a higher minimum parking standard. This requirement can also add a significant cost where parking is required in excess of actual business need. 
And when a tenant is not able to meet the minimum parking standard, they must seek relief through a variance application. This application adds additional time to the project and requires evidence of justification, which is often obtained through a parking study, and it adds additional cost to the applicant or tenant. I've included some examples of local shopping centers, including the Boone's Ferry Center and the Nyberg Retail Center, where we've heard that some potential tenants turn away after learning of the minimum parking requirements. And for additional background, I wanted to highlight that the cost of parking um, can be costly, and this cost is often passed down to tenants, both commercial and residential. So, um, here you'll see some examples of what off-street parking stalls can cost or garage stalls and how it makes up a certain percentage of rent or housing cost. And now we'll transition into our policy discussion and the state rules around vehicle parking mandates. Um, CFAC includes various phases and phase one is currently in effect. This phase eliminates parking mandates or minimum parking requirements within three-fourths a mile of our West Station downtown and within half a mile of frequent transit routes, which includes the 76 and 94. And it also applies to certain uses, um, like affordable units, childcare facilities, and facilities for people with disabilities. As shown on this map, which I know is kind of hard to read, but the darker gray transparency represents where we can no longer require minimum parking requirements. This area includes the vast majority of Tualatin's commercial and multifamily residential areas. These are also the areas where we typically hear the most concern about parking. Um, so as you can see, it extends throughout our downtown area, um, down to Stonebridge, and while it's harder to notice, we did try to identify where we have vacant land if you're curious about that. But in certain areas, let's see if I can get the pointer to work. Like this area right here is the wetlands around Fred Meyer, so it's not necessarily developable. And then this is also a tricky spot to develop um, up by the river. So I just kind of wanted to highlight some of those nuances on this map. your question real quick sure go back why is Boone's Ferry Road not great is what they consider a frequent transit route it could potentially <laughs> change in the future yeah. so I think that's something to consider as we talk through this that when we're looking at policy <clears throat> that's applicable to frequent transit routes it could be a moving target because that's part of their trimester change coming up. Is okay. that frequent route that's up and down? That's good to be aware. Because well, she only included 94 and said that's it. Yeah. yeah. So at our, <laughs> our latest direction from DLCD, they um, asked us to focus on the 76 and 94, okay. if I'm remembering correctly. So moving on to our next slide, um, also in effect are electric vehicle charging requirements that apply to multifamily development applications. New developments must provide electrical conduit to serve 40% of all vehicle parking spaces that are proposed as part of the application. And there's also a separate requirement in our building code. Um, the building code's been updated, so um, commercial development has a standard to provide conduit to 20% of all parking spaces. And that became effective March 31st. And then kind of moving on to um, what's considered phase two of these mandates. As noted in our staff report, Twalton petitioned DLCD and was granted an extension to comply with these phase two rules. So on the slide, you'll see that these rules will take effect June 30th of this year. Phase two includes general parking improvement regulations that expand on the requirements that are currently found in our code. These requirements include additional flexibility to redevelop existing parking lots that may be underutilized. 
Um, they require the addition of an environmental benefit for new parking lots that are proposed over a half an acre in size. And that's roughly about 70 parking spaces. And it sets parking maximums in the town center and near frequent transit. And then moving on to this next slide, um, Tualatin must choose from one of three parking reduction strategies. And um, as part of this slide, staff recommends that council direct staff to begin a legislative development code update to remove parking minimum citywide, and that would be contained under option one. As you can see in option two and three, they require the creation of new programs and policies that can be difficult to explain and implement. And we'll kind of get into these details on the following slides. But first, I, I wanted to share what our neighboring cities are considering or have already implemented. Since we were granted an extension, we got the benefit of seeing what other jurisdictions were doing. And you'll see that most, the majority of them, chose the easiest option, which would be to implement option one. And while Sherwood is exploring option two, it is unknown as to whether DLCD will accept their implementation proposal. I also want to highlight that Sherwood doesn't share the same phase one impacts that we have. We're because of our proximity to frequent transit, it kind of takes over a large portion of our commercial and multifamily areas. So um, Sherwood doesn't necessarily have that. Kind of digging deeper into option one, which is staff's recommendation, this would repeal all parking minimums, making it the easiest option to implement, enforce, and explain. As such, we have programmed the staff capacity and we would be able to accomplish this under our previously discussed work plan. And while there may be some concerns over eliminating the minimum parking requirement, um, we've already discussed that it applies to most of our commercial land and multifamily land. Um, and maybe as another silver lining, Tualatin is mostly developed. So um, that kind of maybe assuages some of those fears. Uh, I think that's what I wanted to highlight on this slide. Did you have anything to add for option one? No, I mean, I think that summarizes it, that we have very little developable area outside of the area in which the repeal is already affected. Okay. Most of it is industrial land and compared to commercial and residential lands, we, if anything, have people who build up to the parking maximums that we already have in industrial lands rather than uh, concern about building to the parking minimums by and large. And option two is more complicated to understand and explain. It requires that a minimum of two parking programs be implemented. This option would shift the burden to small businesses to understand and apply the rules. It would also require reprioritization reprioritization of other projects on our work program so that we could allocate greater staff resources and time to kind of unpack option two. Additionally, it will require funding and resources to implement and monitor. So you'll see um, if we did go down this route, we would have to choose two of these options. Um, as you can see, some of them are to charge parking separately from residential rents or commercial rents. Um, there would be a burden on businesses to figure out a non-vehicle commute reward program. Uh, we don't really have any commercial parking lots, but we could consider a taxing um, code to enforce that if we did see any in the future and that would satisfy the requirements. Um, and then it also kind of tweaks the minimum parking requirement for multifamily development. Then moving on to option three, this is the most complicated to understand and to explain and presents potential livability impacts on residents and businesses. It would also require funding to support new programs and would require a reprioritization of our planning work program to implement. At a high level, this option removes parking requirements for a variety of specific uses. 
um, small sites, changes in use or redevelopments, and within half a mile of our town center. So it would have quite an impact. Um, and as you can see, it, because it contains so many different options and applications, it's just difficult to understand and explain. Um, so I wanted to move on to our schedule and milestones. So if we went with the option one, the easy implementation to remove all parking mandates, staff will begin the legislative development code update process. And um, you can kind of see by this timeline that we anticipate we can come back to you in May for potentially an adoption ready code. Um, in the, the meantime, we'd be working on our draft code and seeking public comment. Um, we would also go to our planning commission and seek a recommendation from them to take to you. Um, and if everything aligns correctly, that would be around April, so we could have our resources ready for you in May. And uh, with that, uh, in closing, staff respectfully recommends that city council direct staff to begin a legislative development code update to remove citywide parking minimums and then to adopt parking maximums in certain areas um, as required by these CFAC requirements. And we would also work on the additional regulations for parking areas over half an acre in size. With that, it concludes my presentation. I'll open this item up for questions and discussion. Council Brooks and Council President Pratt. Um, I can understand why option one makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. My, I'm not going to get into that too much. I my question is more about when they're talking about building and um, having access to electricity through different parking lots and um, residential and commercial development, correct? Mm -hmm. um, how, how is that reflected in any of these options? So it's an outright requirement, so we would write that into our code or just apply it to development applications. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I have to agree that, I mean, of the options we're given, the two and three are just onerous. So um, that being said, I need a couple definitions here. Like, like they're saying frequent transit routes. So that, I mean, I don't know that I would consider what, what's considered frequent. So <laughs> it's, it's written into the OARs, and I don't really have it at top of mind, but I believe it was... Um, I think it was twice hourly, five days a week was considered frequent. Okay, because like, so, I mean, even though they're dumping the 96 off this list, that doesn't even run on the weekend. So it's yeah, not like so I think there's that bonus. stipulation. Yeah. yeah. And then, um, uh, okay, so when it says repeal parking minimums, update maximum parking, does that mean someone could build something with absolutely no parking a developer? Yes. Like they could put no parking spots? I'm um, channeling Councillor Grimes here. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I think that would be unlikely while it wouldn't be written into our code. What I've learned through this research is that when developers are seeking funding for their projects, it's typically a funding requirement that they conduct a parking study and provide okay. parking to meet that demand. Yeah, because like Councillor Grimes had mentioned so many times, like in Northeast Portland, it's 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 um, terrible for businesses because people there's nowhere to park in you can't get into businesses, yeah. so it's... That's my neighborhood. Yeah. I tend okay, to walk a lot know, because of you know, that. <laughs> it's great if you could walk, but it's... Um, I mean, especially when we don't have the best transit, public transit here, it's... I know, it's, I'm just expressing frustration. Yeah. Sorry. And then what is update maximum parking? And then it says um, adopt parking maximums in the town center and their long frequent transit routes. So does that limit how much we can allow? Like, can we... like? For example, in the Hagen lot where there's lots of space, could we build um, a parking structure there or would that not be allowed? So it gets pretty specific in the OARs about what they're looking to adopt maximum parking requirements for. And in my kind of shorthand notes, I have um, that they would be applicable to multifamily, 
commercial and retail uses and for buildings over 65,000 square feet in the town center and along the frequent tra transit routes, but I don't really have those maximum okay. numbers at hand. I guess just to clarify, are you talking about a well, structure, a standalone parking structure? Well, okay, here's, this is just my little dream, but um, as we're doing the core area, it like maybe one vision would be to try to make that core um, more of a walking closed off to cars, but you potentially need a parking garage so people would park and then walk that area. People aren't likely to walk from my house a mile and a half down there and back, but they might come in closer, park, and walk that area. We'll have to follow up on that question to be sure, but I, the, I'm sorry the, to way, the way that I read the code was that the parking maximums applied to specific uses. So it would be, okay. you can have only so many parking per thousand square feet of commercial. So you can only have, you know, say, two maximum spaces you can't, you, the developer, even if they wanted to build more, can't build more. We, in looking at the code, did not read that to apply to like a surface parking lot because there's no, okay. th there's no gotcha. like relationship. A person okay. can build a commercial parking lot and say, I want to have a 300 space commercial parking lot. Why? So because people come here. It's pretty much we're going to be mm -hmm. kind of like Bridgeport <clears throat> without the parking garage where everybody, there's mm -hmm. probably mm -hmm. a little less space than mm -hmm. would be nice, but okay. Well, I'm sorry to go in the weeds there. We'll reconfirm that. Um, yeah, and that's get back okay. to you. I understand okay. me too. Um, yeah, I agree. Option one seems like um, best of the options available. <laughs> Other comments? That's what's psycho. Um, my train of thought went down um, similar to Councillor Pratt's. Um, I won't, was kind of wondering your thoughts on how option one would impact the redevelopment of downtown because we have the yep. uh, we have the district down there mm -hmm. now. Um, and so I'm, I am concerned about that. And similarly, I'm two miles from Fred Myers. And so, I mean, walking down there is not really a, a viable option to run down there and visit those businesses that would be in the core area. Um, so that is concerning. Um, right, you said that funding requires parking, but for how long? Um, I mean, I think we have to think long-term and if different policies change, how do we make sure we're not setting ourselves up for, for failure mm -hmm. where there's no parking downtown? And we don't have the transit right now. Again, things can change in the future. But, um, and then I feel like this is a option mm -hmm. that's better suited for larger downtown core areas like Portland, but we're really not set up to be a walkable city right now. And so it concerns me. Um, I just want to make sure that we're setting ourselves up for success in the future. Um, I'm not super comfortable with option one at this moment. But I'd love to hear others' thoughts. I'll go next. I agree with mm -hmm. Councillor Sacco. Um, the immediate need short term, no impact. Yeah. But there's going to be impact. When the urban renewal zone uh, fires up, um, there's going to be impacts there. I'm sorry, wh whoever, DLCD, I know TriMet's going to put frequent service on 96 because of Autumn Sunrise and because of the SEPA facility. They already told me that. And they're renaming in 96 to either the 74 or the 76. So Boone's Ferry is going to be part of this. So anything along Boone's Ferry all the way down to um, Wilsonville will be impacted by this. Uh, I'm not wild about option one either. Because eventually, we know Tualatin's going to grow. And I'm gonna, we're going to handcuff future city councils, not by our own choice. I know it's the state. When possibly Tualatin jumps I-5 on the east side, and we're going to be handcuffed by all this uh, parking regulations. And we're the ones who get screamed at, as, as well as you two, about no parking in apartment complexes or cars going into my neighborhood or businesses who can't get people into their door because they gotta you know, walk seven or eight blocks. So I am not wild about uh, option number one. Uh, you all know I was told against the CFEC thing to begin with. Um, and I realized Beaverton is, I, what is, because I'm not seeing Hillsborough. What is Hillsborough done? Because they're not on your list. I would have to look into <laughs> that. Um, I, I don't know if they've chosen yet. But yeah, I don't remember. I don't remember hearing. To you. And we have gotten an extension as well. Okay. Yeah, it just it's just frustrating because 
I, I see the goals of what the state's after. As Councilor Sacco just said, we're not Portland. I understand we want to encourage people on multimodal transit, but it doesn't work here today. And it's not going to work for a while until TriMet cooperates and we get better service, right connection, more frequent service. Um, I could, I just, <laughs> when things redevelop, we're going to hear about it. When someone take, buys a chunk of land and they want to put uh, multifamily housing and we're going to say, oh, that's great. Every apartment gets one spot. We're going to hear about it or a future council is going to hear about it. Um, and we're just tying our, I, it just frustrating. I'm sorry. <laughs> this thing just angers the hell out of me. So. And obviously, I mean, we talked about this in our last item, you know, Councillor Brooks raised some great points about like the ability for us to actually study the issue and to put research behind what we're doing as opposed to just kind of this one size fits all approach. Mm -hmm. And so as staff, we certainly hear you loud and clear and are sympathetic with it. I mean, I think the thing that we go back to is, is that the one parking minimum is already applicable citywide. It's already re repealed in the core. And so whatever we're doing tonight is we're talking about the rest of the city. And I mean, I think that your point about the expansions is certainly a tricky one, and that's one that we can't really control. But I think the other thing is, is that, I mean, essentially the startup costs and ongoing cost to do any of, to stand up any of these other programs mm -hmm. for us is not, I mean, again, going back mm -hmm. to this, not really within our means to do it. Um, and, you know, I don't know of a lot of suburban parking programs that even generate enough revenue to actually offset the costs of, uh, right. of having them. Mm -hmm. That's correct. I guess this is more my question to you is like, um, my, I think they all are not great. <laughs> but option two, no more than a half parking space per unit for multifamily. Option three, no mandates within a half mile of town. I mean, they're all bad options. Mm -hmm. They're all suck. So which is yeah. the best of the Which is the worst? least suckiest one. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. And this is, again, don't give me violation of home rule, all the stuff we said. Yeah. And mandates more of this is to come. That's my political <laughs> hat on it. We're, this is not the end. Council Brooks. I'm going to say, too, I appreciate everyone's concerns. Um, I also want to, like, when I think of the downtown area or developers, I um, just from, you know, the appraising work and things like that, it's like there's also um, a market driver. Um, there's other drivers for developers. So as much as I understand the concerns, I think the tolling is a bigger problem for our city, for people that have to pay a fee just to come to Tualatin. Um, and if we do any of these other ones, it will put another burden onto our business community um, that are already gonna be facing a big thing if the tolling goes through. Um, so that's the, and the other piece about it that I want to say as far as, for me, the, the options, the other options just don't make sense. Um, but as far as with the repeal option <clears throat> and with this staff, I think this staff understands the needs of the city very well. And so how it gets written into our code, um, I have trust in that and how things will will change, I have trust in that. Um, so I don't think these are any of the things that we advocated for, but, and we all know we don't live in Portland, but um, I don't see how the other two would be feasible. Um, and from a financial perspective, I mean, that's the only thing, you know, I, I can imagine what you're talking about, people screaming in the future, but I also <laughs> can imagine um, people taking on more fees currently and what that would sound like too. And I just, I understand the point of this city having to explain all of that to all of our different communities that would be impacted. So thanks. So you need 
We're not voting. What's this? Is not a votable. This is well, asking for advice or guidance. It's not a vote. Yeah, what are you looking thank, for? Thank you. We're, we're, <laughs> looking, we're you looking for, I think, consensus direction to move forward with this. So, I mean, if we, you know, if we get consensus direction on council to move forward with option one, then we would basically create a plan text amendment file name that goes along with it and start our work with notifying DLCD of our intention to do it. And then we'll start getting together and drafting the language that actually implements it and then we'll go through the sequence that Aaron described where we'll have public involvement period for people to get involved. Council gets notice of that public involvement period per our code and then we ultimately have a public meeting before planning commission and then finally council consideration of the changes. Is that all before you change? It is, yeah. So, pretty quick. I mean, you've got no choice. I mean, you gotta go option number one because three is definitely out, two, uh, it's too much of a burden. It will never pay for itself. And again, we don't want to tack on additional fees. It's just we've got no choice, and that's what's frustrating and infuriating. Because we shouldn't be put in this situation. It should be up to us. Yeah. We're so, we know you're just the messenger. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we'll wholeheartedly agree. <laughs> you got something? Yeah. Um, so this is a mandate from the state of Oregon, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. Um, did it, was it a mandate based on, I'm sorry, I just, I, I'm trying to remember how we got to this. Was it a mandate as an executive order or was it a mandate as a um, Congress, like the House legislation? So it, it came from an executive order okay. to manage our emissions and climate change. We had the, we had the lawsuit to fight it, but yeah, I remember never, that. Yeah. we did not prevail. I'm, I'm wondering, well, because I always think of like, yeah, we're, we're, I grew up in a big city where there was one parking for one, one, house, one apartment, and it was a nightmare. And, but it was uh, a city that had, I mean, barely rains. So, I mean, it, it, I know where we're getting this from. I know where it came from. I know where this, I know the history of it. And I'm thinking, what applies and what's happening in California doesn't necessarily apply in Oregon. We have a completely different climate, completely different season. And I always feel very irritable when, when a state somewhere else that has better sun gets you know, to do these kinds of things and then it comes to us and then we want to adopt that. And I'm always wondering, do you not consider the people in our state with our season, with our climate, it's not the same. And I always feel like in our big cities, Portland's not even a big city in my opinion compared to LA. And so I always feel like not everything is walking distance and not, I'm, I'm thinking of, of a mom with three kids carrying things, walking in, in the rain in, at four o'clock in the afternoon, eight months out of the year, it's dark here in Oregon. So it's like, it's so unfair to our, to our, community who are people of color, not only that, but just are, are economically challenged already. And it's just really, I feel like that's so unfair when um, everything's so expensive and then on top of that, we're gonna ask them to walk and we're gonna ask them to, you can't just, you can't just, uh, you're gonna have to carry every grocery, piece of grocery two miles or a mile. Um, because you can't park here. I, it just really seems that we're stepping on the little people versus those who can afford it. Yeah, fine. But people who can't afford it, it just makes me a little bit, it makes me angry in a way that we're not considerate or the majority of the people in the country are not on that 1% of wealth. And so it just seems to me that it's just so unfair. And I think that, um, I don't even want to say one, to be honest. Uh, I, I don't even want. I don't even want to accept it. And I know we have to, but at this point and moment, I think I need to process this. But it's just really, it's just unfair. That's that's my comment. Frustration, coming from, you know, someone that has been at the bottom, and you know, we're just keep putting people at the bottom. 
It's just unfair. And that's not, and no, you can't do anything about it. It's just, I want that on the record, I guess. Thank okay. you. So I guess option one, we'll just do it biting our tongues. And spitting you. on the ground and everything, all the other things. <laughs> I appreciate the discussion. Thank you for the direction. Right. Thanks for your time tonight, Council. Good evening. All right. Let me get my cool down a little bit. That's it. It's not going to help. It's not going to help. So that brings us to uh, items removed from consent. Uh, we had none. Uh, Council communications, any communications? Council Brooks. I just, I just wanted to acknowledge um, that, you know, people, that it was a lot of people were in their houses, a lot of people lost electricity, including the mayor, and had other things happen. Um, but luckily everyone is safe in our city and, um, but it's hard to go through those kind of events. So I just wanted to, you know, just say that, um, that I understand and that um, I'm glad that our community holds together in these kind of situations. Other communications? I just wanna take a couple moments um, I sent the emails out, but I just want to acknowledge the passing of two folks in our community who were very impactful on Tualatin. First, uh, Mike McKillop passed unexpectedly uh, a few days ago. He was, a, he was our city engineer uh, back when I first started in city council. And as I mentioned in the email, he taught me a lot about water, sewer, and especially transportation. Uh, he was acknowledged as a guru of what uh, of city engineers he was the go-to person and he helped guide a lot of the development in Tualatin um, and I just want to acknowledge his passing it's such a shame um, this you know the impact you know one person can have you know I look, I look at Mike McKillop and then the impact you know Mike McCarthy's had uh, these city engineers do a lot for cities and most of the time people have no idea who they are um, they don't get a lot of exposure, but they're critical in, uh, in our communities to making things work. The second thing is uh, Mayor Gary Sherrado of Durham uh, passed away. Uh, Gary was interesting. He was terrific to work with. 25 years as mayor of Durham. Uh, he made it a point that when there's a new mayor, he would always reach out to that new mayor and help mentor you. He helped me out a lot as well as, you know, uh, Mayor Ogden, uh, for a person who represented a small, small city, this guy would be in Salem telling the legislators what to do, throwing his weight around way above his weight class. <laughs> and he was a huge advocate, especially when it came for transportation in this area. Gary knew the stuff in and out. Um, he ran Durham very, very well, all, what, one and a half FTE of Durham serving his community. Um, I just remember Gary being, um, he was very fiscally conservative, no surprise there from Durham, but he was very socially liberal. Um, he was very active in um, Black Lives Now, uh, Black Lives Matter, all the racial uh, upset we had a few years ago, the anti-Trump things. He was very socially motivated and we lost um, a big asset. Um, I'm very sorry for the city of Durham because with his passing, uh, there goes 25 years of history and they have a brand new city manager who now has lost a go-to person. Uh, as I understand it, the Durham City Council is gonna meet this week to pick a new mayor because they pick from within themselves. Uh, but I just wanna acknowledge Gary's impact uh, if you knew Gary and you want to be part of the celebration of his life, it's going to be February 4th at 2 p.m. at the MAC. Uh, I have a feeling get there early. <laughs> it's going to be very crowded because, again, he was, for again, small city, very boisterous voice for uh, our area, not just for Durham, 
but for Tigard, Tualatin, Sherwood, Durham, and King City, uh, the lines all melded together for Gary. So that's it. Uh, anything else? We'll go ahead and close this. If people want like a five minute break before the TDC. We got another meeting after this. <laughs> all right. It's just consent. You want to just rip through it? All right. Let's go. So I'll go ahead and uh, close Tualatin City Council meeting. And I'll go ahead and call to order the Tualatin Development Commission meeting. Uh, first item is public comment. Uh, public comment, it's an opportunity for anyone in the audience or in Zoom who would like to address an item that's not on the commission's agenda tonight. Uh, please leave, uh, limit your comments to three minutes. Is there anyone in Zoom or this very sparsely populated hall <laughs> who wants to testify? Yeah, is, is Don still hanging around? <laughs> right. I have no, nothing to add. <laughs> <laughs> He's still there. All right. <laughs> Moving on to consent. Uh, the consent agenda is an, uh, a list of items that will be adopted with one motion. Uh, I'll ask the commissioners uh, if they would like anything removed from consent tonight. And if not, we can go ahead and vote, this, uh, vote on this with a voice vote. So on the consent agenda, we have two items. Uh, item number one, consideration of resolution number 63624 of the Tualatin Development Commission approving the annual fiscal financial report for FY 2022-2023. Now we know why Don's hanging around. <laughs> number two, consideration of approval of the Tualatin Development Commission meeting minutes of June 26, 2023. Would any commissioner like one of these items pulled from consent? I, motion, I move that we adopt the consent agenda as read. Second. I have a motion and a second to adopt the consent agenda as read. Uh, any discussion on those motions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? It's unanimous. Do so I have a call for an adjournment of the commission? So moved. Second. <laughs> I have a motion and a second to adjourn this commission meeting. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Good night. Thank you. Thank you.